we, we run things through in order to come to the conclusions we come to today, especially given the circumstances of the world around us. Um, so we're going to embark upon that journey for the next few weeks, specifically looking at how to discover a biblical worldview. Now, I'm purposely using the word biblical and not Christian worldview. And I want you to make note of that because there's a difference, all right? The first term, which is our goal, biblical worldview, is what comes from Scripture, what comes from the Word of God, and specifically what comes from the teaching and teachings of Jesus, all right? The second one, Christian worldview, unfortunately, is more of a cultural term, okay? It represents a worldview that has come from traditions, that's come from behaviors, that's come from things that have been handed down through the centuries, and in this post-resurrection uh, or so-called Christian era that we are actually moving out of or have moved out of. Most people would say that we are living now in a post-Christian era. We are no longer the dominant worldview thinking of our current culture, all right? So a Christian worldview is really tied up with a lot of things that are not necessarily Bible. We want to concern ourselves with getting a biblical worldview, amen? So we know that we're not the majority. We know that it's not necessarily serving us well, the term Christian worldview. So we want to concentrate on, as I said, a biblical worldview. And we want to do that in order to answer and to face the issues and the questions that we have confronting ourselves today. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the problem is that we've lost sight of a biblical worldview in exchange for what we were calling that Christian worldview. And now we need to do some digging. We, we need to do what I view as kind of like real true biblical archaeology. Right? Every believer needs to be an archaeologist. Okay? My first date with my wife was to see the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. Dun, 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 dun. Right? With, with the bull whips and the hats and the flying and the big stones and digging for things. And I don't know. He never spent any two minutes digging and pulling anything out of the ground. You know, so he's just running away from everything and all, all the evil empire of the Germans and all that kind of stuff. But an archaeologist, right? How cool. Every believer should be a biblical archaeologist. Every believer should have a, a hat with a light on that goes deep into the Word of God, that digs out the Word of God, that goes out of their way to pull it out. Did you ever, did you ever get to see an archaeological dig? When I was in North Dakota, I got to see a few of them. Let me tell you, for the most part, that's a boring thing. All right? You watch this stuff in the movies, and it's all exciting, you know? Um, like I think of Jurassic Park, those, those movies. When they started those movies and they, you know, they were all archaeologists digging out stuff and then it all came alive and yada, yada, yada. But really what it is mostly is meticulously tapping little spots and giant, with a bunch of people around you, tapping and hauling dirt out. And then all of a sudden you find a little tiny thing and you got to take that out and put it someplace else. And then you got to wash it off and you got to put it in, in solvents. And then you got to brush it and, and, and see what's there and make sure you don't do any damage and all this kind of stuff. Pretty much what Chris does with his metal detector, right? He does all that kind of stuff, right? So we, we want to do that, though, with the Word of God. We want to take on the attitude of an archaeologist this morning. We've got to dig out some of these answers for ourselves, and we've got to stop. We have got to stop looking to other things besides the Bible for answers to issues. Amen? So this morning, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at forming a biblical worldview. We're going to look at foraging, forging, not foraging, forging a biblical worldview. And then we're going to look at defining a biblical worldview. And we're going to use four verses from the Apostle Paul in four of his letters as kind of our anchor point. So I'm going to just read those verses to you now, starting with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, which says, You used to live in sin. Just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. So who's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God? The devil. Amen? Second, Romans 12.2, another probably familiar verse. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Let me say that again. 
Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And then over to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Right? There are a lot of people that, think that, that you know, they sound like they know something, but their words are hollow. Okay? They're empty. Too many believers, just because somebody's using a large vocabulary, just fall down and acquiesce to whatever that person might be promoting or pushing or pumping. Let me tell you, the Word of God trumps all that. All right? The Word of God trumps all that. I don't care how smart anybody may be. That has nothing to do with truth. Because truth is not a matter of education. Truth is a matter of relationship, and that's with God. And the last scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. We have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit. We have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. I mean, basically, all those, all those passages... And if you were to go back to each of those verses and look at the context of what they're in, they're all speaking about how we look at things, about how do we come to conclusions, how do we draw and make decisions, right? Let me tell you something. There's a school of thought, for example, that'll tell you, you need to make a decision on whether you should buy something based on what's in your bank account. I get it, right? Right? If, if you've got $100 in your bank account and you want to buy something that's $150, your bank account has a clear answer for you, does it not? All right, and so logic would, would say, I can't buy that right now. But there are times where God wants to bless, where God wants to do things and may actually provide. Amen? May provide for you to be able to do that because he delights in the desires of your heart. And I'm not talking about things. I'm using a very simplistic example here, right? Please understand this. This is not a prosperity preaching moment, okay? What I am saying, though, is what we believe is what we do, and what we do must be what we believe. And your actions speak louder than your words. And we'll get to that in a minute. So let's look at forming a biblical worldview. Perhaps the most respected recent leader or at least a Christian, that was actually respected by the world was probably the late Billy Graham. All right? It's said that in his lifetime, he preached, to over, he preached the good news to over 200 million people personally. Not TV. Personally. 200 million people. Just let that sink in for a minute. That's a bit of a crowd. Amen? Over all those years, he was in ministry. His impact was absolutely enormous, yet his calling was so simple. He once qu was quoted saying this. He said, my purpose in life is to help people find a personal relationship with God, which I believe comes through knowing Christ. I love simple. Anybody love simple? I love simple. I, went to, I, was, at part, I was on staff at a church once, and their mission statement, you had to get like a doctoral degree. to get through. It, They had it on the wall. So help me, it took a space this big to put their mission statement, right? And I, I would hear the senior pastor constantly complaining, nobody in this church understands the mission statement. And I'd be like, yeah, nobody understands three words in the mission statement, much less the whole statement, because every other word was this long. And, and it made no sense, and it wasn't exactly how anybody talked, which is why I've always been so motivated, which is why when we got here and we identified a new mission statement, right? We made it simple. You can remember it. You can repeat it. You don't have to have a card in your pocket, so you have to read it off like some kind of cheap salesman. Like you're selling Amway somewhere. Knock, knock, knock. You know, that's not what it is. It's simple. It should come from you. Billy Graham's life purpose was simple, and he was extremely effective. His ministry, however, 
only began to blossom, only came and started to really bear fruit after he went through a very personal crisis. And it resulted in him forming a biblical worldview. You see, just before that famous Los Angeles tent meeting that put him into the public eye in 1946, right, this giant outpouring, this huge revival that happened in Los Angeles under his preaching, his good friend and another celebrated evangelist of the day, uh, Charles Templeton, had walked away from Christ, had decided that the Bible was not a reliable source, lost faith in the Word of God, because he had had so many instances of scientists at that time and philosophers bombarding him with facts, and he couldn't answer them fast enough for his own satisfaction that he lost faith. That shook Billy Graham right to the very core of his being. It made him face the realities of what he believed and why he believed them. I think every believer every now and then needs to face the reality of what do you believe, but why do you believe it? It's not just good to know what you believe. You need to know why you believe it. He needed to identify his worldview, just like you and I have to do. The church can't identify your worldview for you. All right? Your pastor cannot identify your worldview for you. I can help you. I can assist you. I can help guide you. But you must rely on the Word of God and Holy Spirit to develop your personal worldview. And hopefully in this church, all of our individual worldviews will align themselves with each other. But Billy Graham was shaken with this. So on a quiet walk in that California, uh, he was at a retreat center in California before that revival meeting, that tent meeting, he went on a personal walk to talk to God to, to filter out all of the stuff going on in his mind. And he dropped to his knees along the path in front of a tree stump, and he threw his Bible out on the tree stump, and he prayed a prayer that, that was unbelievable. He said, Oh God, there are many things in this book that I do not understand. There are many problems with it for which I have no solution. There are many seeming contradictions. There are some areas in it that do not seem to correlate with modern science. I can't answer some of the philosophical and psychological questions Chuck, meaning Chuck Temple, Charles Templeton, and others are raising. After pointing all of that out, which weighed him down so heavily, Holy Spirit helped young Billy Graham to finish his prayer like this. He ended his prayer by saying, Father, I am going to accept this as the word by faith. I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubts. And I believe I will, excuse me, and I will believe this to be your inspired word. And that settled Billy Graham's worldview, and he became the man that all of us in this room knew him to be all those years later. All of Graham's doubts faded. He now had a worldview which began with scripture, and he never wavered from it. The rest of it, as they say, is absolute history. Graham submitted his worldview to divine revelation over his own understanding that day. This is exactly what we all need to do today. Because we live in the world and the society we live in, we put too much of a premium on understanding. Some people, you know, listen, as a pastor for 40 years, I have had people coming to me going, Pastor, I just don't understand. And I get a lot of grief when I answer back, neither do I. Well, wait a minute, you're supposed, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Understanding and knowing some things is two different things. Do I understand why this happens to a person? Do I understand why somebody loses a loved one? Do I understand why a child gets a disease? Do I understand why an entire nation falls away from God? I mean, I have my thoughts. I have my opinions. I can read a lot. I can come up with a pretty educated opinion, can't I? But that doesn't mean I understand. That doesn't mean I have a settlement in my heart and in my mind. And there are some things I just take by faith because I know that God will never do harm, that God will never do wrong. 
So it doesn't bother me when somebody comes up to me. Well, if God is so loving, you ever hear that sentence? I know it's coming. It doesn't matter what they're talking about after that. If God is so loving, well, first of all, they've got a different worldview. Because their definition of love is way different from mine. Their definition of love is nothing more than animal. My definition of love is spiritual and is based on a relationship, not on an activity. Amen? They don't understand that. If we today, in this post-Christian world, try to engage others with a wrong and maladjusted worldview, we're going to pay the price. It'll kill your faith. Our view of authority and our subsequent actions must be surrendered to the Word of God. Okay? This takes hard work, and we must be willing to fight to get to it, because there will be resistance. And let me say it again. Donald Trump and Joe Biden will never be the answer. If you think either one of those men are the answer to our problems, you already have confessed to not having a biblical worldview. Because that's not what the Bible teaches us. There's one name that has the answer, right? I think you might know it. Let's talk a little bit then. In understanding forming a worldview, a biblical worldview, let's talk about forging one. Because like I said, it's work. Forging is work. Right? When a blacksmith forges something out of metal, this is hard work. Do you ever watch an actual blacksmith? Do you ever get an opportunity to watch a blacksmith work? You want to talk about sweat? Oh, my gosh. Right? I mean, first of all, they're strong as all get out usually. You, you don't want to go up to the blacksmith and call him a name. All right? They're usually big dudes. And they're lifting up heavy metal, and they're putting it in this intense heat, and they're pulling things out, and they're hitting it, steel, and it's bang and bang, and they're shaping things. Shaping things. I can do that with Play-Doh. <laughs> and maybe clay. I might be able to whittle something that looks like something else. I tried to do a self-portrait in a freshman art class when I was a kid. In clay. Horrified the whole class. It looked like something, you know, like I expected Edward G. Robinson to go, Yeah, Moses, where's your God now? Because I had made this the ugly thing, which was supposed to be me. And then I had, when people, you know what it's like to make something really ugly? And then have people say, what's it supposed to be? Me? <laughs> I couldn't forge anything out of clay. I'm amazed that these guys, they forge things out of metal. Hot metal. It's amazing. Five years ago, speaking of hot, John, I'm going to, we're not going to do that? All right, that's not happening. All right, never mind. I was going to show you a video, but that's okay. We'll, we'll talk about it. Because you guys will remember. Five years ago, the hottest debate in all of social media networking. It was on Facebook, it was on Twitter, it was everywhere you went. Was that argument, is that dress blue and black? Or is that dress white and gold? How many people remember that? Right? And it went around like crazy. And the amazing thing about this dress is that I was actually, we're not able to play it right now, but I was actually able to find like 27 news reports. News reports! on whether the dress was black and white. And then people lining up in the street arguing with each other. Arguing with each other over whether the dress was black and blue or white and gold. Pretty lightweight topic compared to what we're looking at today, is it not? Yet look at the arguments that ensued, that went on, the intensity that people had over this. It's a clear indication, however, how people can look at the same thing and see completely different aspects of it, right? I mean, come on. There are times when you hear somebody say something about an opinion or an aspect or whatever, and you're like, how in the world do you, how did you come to that conclusion, right? People see things very differently. Anybody who's married knows the reality of what I'm talking about, amen? I'll just let that sink in for a minute. And those of you that were stewing about something before you came to church today, maybe you want to let that go. I'm not bringing it up so you can say, see, I told you. Right? 
The real issue is when the problems that we're talking about or the disagreements that we're having are about issues which are far more intense and personal than a simple dress, than an $80 Amazon dress. Moral issues, issues of fairness or justice, all present escalations that we're seeing, we can barely survive the argumentation that's happening today. We see it everywhere. Just stand outside the Supreme Court when a major landmark decision's being made, right? You get both the groups that are fighting outside and they're screaming and yelling at each other and sometimes violence breaks out and people harm each other and hurt each other now. You used to, hey listen, you know, we like to call ourselves so, um, you know, civilized today that we've grown so much as a nation and our knowledge is so much, but you go back 150 years and, you know, you can get people that were able to hate each other's points of view, but still be able to sit at a dinner table together and not ruin everybody's good time. I mean, Lincoln and Douglas had those famous debates and they hated each other at a certain level. And they said some pretty hefty things, but there weren't any riots. Nobody died at a debate. Not like today. For all of our sophistication, we're some pretty foolish generation. The difference today and in every generation is our world view. Our world view informs how we will see and respond to everything. Whether that's a major issue of morality or a simple problem of the color of a dress, how I respond is going to be dictated by my world view. It's going to be by, dictated by however I see things in the world. And if I see things in the world based upon what the talking heads on Fox and CNN are telling me, then I'm probably going to have a bad reaction to things. Right? When I think... Sometimes you've got to stop and think, should I say this or shouldn't I say this? When I think of the foolishness of the number of people out there today who are posting things on their social media and, and patting themselves on the back saying, yeah, I've taken care of this situation. Let me tell you, you're anti this or anti that or your little meme or whatever the thing is, ain't doing nothing. It's not changing the world. You're not solving the problem. You're not helping. You're pouring gasoline to a raging fire. We have lost relationship. Right? You really want to change somebody's mind? Sit down, as we say in Italian, facci to facci. Face to face. Right? Don't blind somebody on this stupid thing. It's, it's foolishness. It's foolishness. I, I, it, it boggles my mind how many people think that because they put in an opposing opinion on Facebook or on anything else, that everybody else who has the opposing opinion is going to go, oh, well, I didn't see it that way. Naturally, you're right. I, I'm so sorry for disagreeing. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Has anybody ever come up to you and said, man, I saw that meme and I, I just changed my mind? I've heard people say, I saw that meme and I lost my mind. But I've never heard anybody do that. Where do we get off? Whether it's a major issue or a simple, stupid little thing, we, may, we have to make sure we know where our worldview is coming from, which is why, finally, we have to define this morning, we have to define our worldview. Let me give you a quick definition. Quick definition of a biblical worldview, or a worldview, a good worldview in any way, shape, or form, would be a set of fundamental beliefs that inform the way we see and engage the world. Okay, let me say that again. A, a, a good definition of, of a worldview is a fundamental set of beliefs that inform the way we see and engage the world. It's the very framework by which we interpret everyday life and make our decisions. Chuck Colson referred to it years ago as the sum total of our beliefs about the world the big picture that directs our daily decisions and our actions. It's also been called by uh, an Anglican bishop, N.T. Wright, some of you may have heard of him, 
uh, he, he said that it is the grid upon which are plotted the multiple experiences of life. So hopefully, as believers, we know this has to include for us to make that worldview, a biblical worldview, this book. Amen? It's got to include the Word of God. Which means the center of our worldview revolves around how we understand God, how we understand ethics, how we understand truth, and how we understand reality. Questions like, does God exist? What is truth? How do we distinguish between good and evil? What is the meaning and the purpose of my life? All the answers to these questions and similar ones comprise our worldview. You don't get your worldview based on what some newscaster says about a situation. You don't get it based on reading the latest book with statistics and whatnot in it. You get it based on the answer to the most important questions in your life and in my life and in all of our lives. We all have the same set of questions no matter what your background, no matter what your upbringing, no matter what your race, no matter what your sex, no matter what your height, weight, or any other distinction you want to put on yourself. We all have the same basic questions needed to answer in order to form a worldview. We need to ha be able to answer our definition of what, what, what is right, what is wrong, and, and some of these things we just mentioned. Our true answers are not necessarily what we say, though, but how we act. I've met lots of people who say they have a biblical worldview. And if you ask them certain questions, they'll tell you, well, this is what I believe. But then you put them in a situation and watch their activity or their reaction, and you find it really different from what they said. It's our worldview, which is empowered by Holy Spirit, which makes us respond negatively to a bad court decision or positively to a celebrity or an athlete who praises God. You know what I mean? When you hear the Supreme Court put down a decision like we've heard them do a week or two ago, whenever that was, we, from our worldview, from a biblical worldview, it was a really bad thing. And we were right to react to it by saying, that's not good. But it's our biblical worldview that determines that. Amen? And it's the same thing when all of a sudden you see an athlete who actually stops and prays in the middle of the field or, or gives some testimony or a witness or something like that, that makes you feel that was so nice. That was good because our biblical worldview says that that's what people should be doing anyway. Our worldview contributes to how we vote, to who we befriend, to what channels we watch, to hundreds of actions and decisions we make day in and day out. Our worldview contributes to all of them. In essence, our worldview is the machine running in the background of our thinking that influences us at all times, not the influencers on TikTok. All right? The eye opener here is that our worldview is often a byproduct of three things. Those three things are our decisions, our habits, and our influences. Nothing will destroy your worldview if you make a string of bad decisions that aren't based in biblical fact, right? If you've developed bad habits, right? Right now, I see a lot of believers developing the bad habit of fear. There's fear-mongering left and right out there. That's a bad worldview. Okay? So those decisions, those habits, and those influences. If you're hanging around and listening to... Listen. If Jesus doesn't speak louder to you more than Sean Hannity, you're going to have a bad worldview. It won't be biblical. Right? If Rachel Maddow's got a louder voice than Jesus Christ in your life, to your worldview. It ain't biblical. Okay? It's just not biblical. Christians are so afraid of telling people, well, I base all my decisions on the Bible. 
because people go, well, you're going to base it on that old, dusty, de you know, outdated, well, that, that thing's been disproven a thousand times. Anybody who makes a statement that's been disproven a thousand times, let me give you the French word for what they are. Idiot. Because time and time and time again, real true science backs up every word written in this book. And they're still coming at us with how much they know. They know nothing. Right? I don't know everything. I don't know everything. I know that I give the image that I think I know everything. All right? So all of you having that thought, you can repent and pray later. I mean, my sister-in-law one time gave me the know-it-all book, uh, the know-it-all lover's book or something like that. I mean, everybody in my family just looks at me like that and calls me that all the time. But the fact of the matter is, is I know nothing. What I do have is Holy Spirit living inside of me, and he knows everything. So I know that I can come up with the right decision in everything I do. Does that mean that it's infallible? That sometimes I don't make a bad decision? Of course not. Why? Because I got a flesh suit on like the rest of you. And sometimes I do stupid. Amen? Thank you for giving me a weak amen on that confession. But the truth of the matter is, is that I can walk in confidence that I can do the right thing. You can walk in confidence that I can do the right thing. I can walk in confidence that you can do the right thing if you are filled with Holy Spirit. If the Bible is your main reading source. If you've given attention to this more than you've given attention to anything else, you're good. You'll do the right thing. Your biblical worldview will be developed. You'll start learning things and learning things and learning things. And they'll start coming. You'll become a really smart person. You may not even be able to stand yourself. You'll be so smart. It's a good, good thing. The culture and the communities that we expose ourselves to can have a profound effect, negatively or positively, on our worldview. A worldview, in truth, evolves over our lives as well. That's another simple truth. Just think about it. How many of you who are full-grown adults have some beliefs now that are extremely different than what you believed as a teenager? Right? You've changed your worldview. Right? The changes can come quickly or they can take decades as our influences and our actions may warrant. Your worldview can change after the death or, or after a birth, after a lifetime, or after a moment. Your worldview can change. Those events that we call life-changing or earth-shattering. You ever hear somebody say, I had an earth-shattering experience. Typically after that is going to come the story of how they look at things differently. Because those moments in life change your worldview. They change how you think. Because you see something for what it really is in a way you never saw it before. We are therefore being changed by and changing our worldview all the time. You're being changed by your worldview and you're changing your worldview all the time. Hopefully, if you're basing it on this, it's getting closer and closer to what he would have it be. The closer you grow to God the more changes you'll see. At the same time, the further you stray from God, the more changes you will see. The point is, is that you can never just stay. Right? Anybody who says, this is my worldview, and I will never change. Yeah. Let's just sit back and watch that hayride. Right? We're moving. We're living. What is this called? The living word of God. Does that mean it changes? No. That means it changes us. That means you become different. That means all of a sudden you have patience in situations you didn't have patience in. That means all of a sudden you have mercy in situations you didn't have mercy in. That means all of a sudden all those fruits that are listed on that list over there by Noah, all those fruits will change your worldview as they are allowed to come up in your spirit. Amen? It's ultimately our actions which reveal the truth of our worldview, what we truly believe. While many people claim, like I mentioned, to have certain worldviews, their habits and their reactions paint a different story. How someone responds re uh, reveals their worldview, not what they say. The most common and ordinary interaction with others can reflect our commitment to and our convictions about our uh, professed worldview. How we respond to the challenges and the questions of life exposes our worldview. It's absolutely essential for us to understand here and now that without this truth, 
we may be forced to admit our worldview is not what we thought it was. Can I get the guys to come back up here? And I want us, uh, I'm going to close in a minute here, but I want us to do the last song we did uh, a few moments ago when we closed out our service today. So if you guys would come forward and get ready for that. So, in conclusion, any congregation's favorite sentence from their preacher? Wow. Nothing? <laughs> See, oh, okay, I got to, what, what did he say? So that tells me why. Okay. So, in conclusion... You've heard it said, there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole, right? Uh, absolute truth, right? We need to ask God to examine our worldview, both what we say we believe and how we live and how we are. Why not ask him this morning? Why not ask him this week? Why not do, as Billy Graham did 75 years ago, let's drop to our knees Let's throw the Bible out on the tree stump in front of us. And let's be able to pray and find our worldview and seek the face of God so hard that we do not get up until we say like him, Father, I'm going to accept this as thy word by faith. I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and my doubts. And I will believe this to be your inspired word. Amen. Stand with me. We're going to sing that last song again. And I want you, as we sing it, to be thinking about what avenue can you allow God so that your worldview lines up with this book? I want you to ask yourselves, what are the things, while we're singing, what are the things that I am currently involved in that may be Steering me away. And for everybody, it can be different things. Listen, this isn't Pastor Jim saying we can't have fun. Right? We've all had experiences probably. Maybe most of us have been around long enough. You've all been to places, churches, where it's all about you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. Right? You know, no fun. Right? The first thing they told me when I, when I became a, a, a student in Bible college and the denomination I was in was like, no drinking, no dancing, no smoking, no... I mean, it was like a list. Like, oh, okay, right? I mean, God had 10 commandments, and they felt he needed a few more. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't get it. And where was the joy? So I'm not trying to remove joy. But I'm telling you, I'm trying to remove some bad sources of joy. I will be upfront and honest about that. Because if your source of joy isn't God, then you're, you're taking enjoyment out of things he didn't mean you to enjoy. That doesn't mean everything you do is wrong, right? Because in Christ, I can enjoy a football game. There is many a wife who thinks their husband is sinning because he's enjoying football. It doesn't work like that. Although now that the NFL is going off, it's not. Maybe so. I don't know if I'm going to ever watch NFL again. But you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that something you do for pleasure is wrong. I'm not saying pleasure is wrong. I'm just saying that... I, you know, my wife knows, I get a lot of enjoyment out of painting, for example. And so when I'm painting something, I'm in a good place, right? I'm off by myself with God, and I usually have some sort of music in the background that's ministering to my ear portals as I use my eye portals and try to paint something. And I always ask God, before I pick up a canvas and a brush, I ask God to bless my hand. That whatever I paint, whether I like it or not, is something that's pleasing to him. Because in my past life, before Jesus, I painted a lot of things that I knew were not pleasing to God. Because my joy, even in the pleasure of the painting, has to come from Him. Because what I want to hear at the end of the painting, I love it when people say, oh, that's, that's a beautiful painting. I love that. What am I, a chucklehead? I'm not going to like that? Of course I like that. But it doesn't even compare to, well done, my son. Good job, boy. Every now and then, God says to me, good job, boy. Feels way better than any compliment I could ever get anywhere else. Amen? Amen. So as we sing, begin asking yourself, what are the things that might be getting in the way? Lord, I come, I confess, Bowing here, I find my rest without you. 